Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust, and I want to thank you for sending us here to the Chickamauga Battlefield. We're having a fantastic time exploring the battlefield. We have talked about the action that took place on September 18th. We're going through the action that took place on September 19th, and in just a few minutes, we're going to bring in historian Jim Ogden to fill us in. But to tell us where we're at, we're at Vineyard Field. We're right here next to the monument for the 72nd Indiana Regiment which I'm gonna do my best Tim Smith of the East and say they're in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> they're down here on this end of the battlefield. We've been talking about how the battle has been extending southward, trying to hold the page in the wind here. Um, we've been talking about how the, uh, the battle has been extending southward and now we're really kind of getting toward that southern terminus. Before I turn things over to Jim though, I wanna talk about one of the most common questions I get as a battlefield interpreter, and that is, if there was a fight here, how come there are no bullet holes in the monuments? And in fact, right here, we can see on the 72nd uh, monument, we've got bullet holes right there and right there, proof that a raging battle did in fact take place here. Now, I can't, see, look at there, the police are coming to investigate right now. <laughs> now, I can't take credit for that joke because it does come from Jim, who was kind enough to point out that those are actual bullet holes, uh, although they are not wartime bullet holes. But Jim, you've been getting us through the battlefield on the first day uh, and the second day. We're up to September 19th, and the action has been chaotic, crisscrossing, flanks are threatened, re-threatened. Things are really, really chaotic as we're extending south. Right, and we have now arrived at what's going to become the south end of the general battle line that develops on September the, um, the 19th. Um, but, um, but more importantly, we are directly west of uh, the mass of Confederates that Bragg had gotten across the creek the day before and had massed for what he thought was going to be his attack against the Union left flank at Lee and Gordon's Mill, still about a mile to the south of where we are um, right now. Um, and while some of those troops had been sent northward to join this developing fight on the 19th, the troops in the front line were still basically in the same position. And this includes the two divisions under the command of John Bell Hood. Um, Hood with his left arm still um, in a sling across his chest from his wound he'd received outside that small South Central Pennsylvania college town 11 weeks earlier. Um, Hood has come down um, here with his troops as they pass through Richmond um, and he, um, upon arriving, Braxton Bragg has given him command of not only the three brigades of his division that have arrived, but also the provisional division under Bushrod Johnson, which is made up of Johnson's own brigade and two brigades that have arrived from Mississippi. And so Hood has a small corps on September the 19th, and they had been positioned in the woods to the east of the Lafayette Road there as part of this mass of Confederates that Bragg had hoped to launch against the Union left flank at Lee and Gordon's Mill. But that doesn't happen, and the battle has roared south through the morning and now early afternoon, and John Bell Hood wants to join the fight, and he will send Bushrod Johnson's division in, and at the moment, that Bushrod Johnson's division moves forward. The fight is going on to Johnson's right and front. It's actually some of the fighting associated with Carnes's battery in Van Cleve's division. And as so many of the units um, do here on the 19th, they march to the sound of the guns and Johnson will wind up veering to the northwest. Um, now his left will actually cross the Lafayette Road just to the north of us and move into the big field that you see there in the far distance to our north. Um, but um, Johnson's attack will largely be blunted by Federals um, who are, um, are in his front or coming up in his front. Hood will then order the three brigades of his division under Evander Law to advance and they will fracture um, again as happened um, 11 weeks earlier. Law's Alabama Brigade will veer off to the, um, uh, to the right um, some, um, but moving here towards the sound of the guns at that moment will be two brigades, um, Henry um, Rock Benning's uh, Georgia Brigade and the Hood's old brigade, the Texas Brigade, now under Jerome Robertson. 
and they will be moving from the northeast towards the southwest um, and will wind up actually driving federal. Some of those represented by the monuments you see behind um, uh, me, they, they'll drive those federals across the Lafayette Road um, and cross the Lafayette Road themselves, only to find out that this position is backstopped by what is the most powerful Union Brigade on the battlefield, the brigade under John Thomas Wilder, five regiments, four of which are here, that artillery battery under Eli Lilly, and those four regiments who are, that are here with Wilder are all armed with the Spencer repeating rifle. And we have with us today one of the very Spencer repeating rifles that was used in this, um, this fight. This is the one carried by Benjamin McGee, a member of the 72nd Indiana, um, who was positioned along this sector where we are um, right now and it would have this view as you have across this field at Confederates who are attacking out of the woods on the other side. And of course, this is a, a magazine fed, um, a tubular magazine through the stock. And Dr. Hodges has pulled the magazine follower out. You drop seven internally primed, self-contained copper cartridge cased um, cartridges into the magazine. Um, and then by working the rolling block action, you um, can seat those into the chamber um, and load and fire this weapon much faster than a standard single shot muzzle loading rifled musket. Now we know that this weapon was carried um, here by McGee for a couple of reasons. Um, the old story is that Wilder and his men bought their own Spencers. Well, when they were prepared to do that when um, Rosecrans authorizes Wilder to mount his brigade and they're gathering their animals in Middle Tennessee and Wilder wants um, better weapons for his men now that they are mounted. Wilder actually wanted the Henry originally, but the Henry Company couldn't provide um, the numbers. And Wilder was making arrangements with his business connections in Indiana to potentially buy these weapons and the men had agreed to buy them back. But in the end, the weapons that were actually issued to Wilder's Brigade are government-owned Spencers. And we know that now by um, some careful study by, Harvey, uh, by Wilder Brigade researchers John McQueen and Harvey Cash um, and, and Bob Becker um, and others who have gone to the National Archives and found some surviving um, uh, serial number lists in um, company and regimental books from the brigade in the National Archives. But then also at the end of the war, um, men who were carrying a Spencer that the War Department classed as in condition three or four, essentially worn out, they were offered the opportunity to buy the weapon and take it home. $3.50 out of their final settlement. And sometimes on those final settlement documents, the serial number of the weapon was recorded. And matching that against the other records, and then also the serial number list from the Spencer Company, we know that they were government-owned arms. And this one is in that range, um, and it comes out of McGee's family um, in, um, in Indiana. One of the characteristics of almost every Wilder carried Spencer would be right here. This was originally a much more pronounced piece of wood, but as they laid them on their saddle pommels, that will rub down. And you can compare that on any Wilder Spencer to another Spencer, and it'll be totally different from the wear. Now, we're, we're lucky with this one. McGee writes the unit history. He tells us what happened here, and he recounts many charges. That I think this field changed his hand multiple times over three hours. And during that time, many men go to ground in the ditch behind us. In fact, Lily will bring his battery at one point when Benning's Georgians are in there and fire canister the length of the ditch. McGee, in his night falls on September 19th, is sent with a friend to the ditch for picket duty. And he talks about the wails of the wounded in that ditch. How horrible it was to hear them crying, how it was one of the longest nights of his life. When the morning uh, uh, sun comes up on the 20th and they look to the rear, 72nd Indiana and the rest of Wilder's brigade have pulled back and their friends are no longer here. But McGee does return to the regiment 
and uses this through the rest of the Bible. And um, on his final settlement, does he record, is the serial number recorded? The serial number is not recorded, but it is recorded that he purchased his Spencer. Right. And, and it, it, this comes directly out of family, his family hands, yes. um, tracked um, through. So, so we, um, uh, we, we have now a, a lot more information about um, how Wilder got his, um, his men rearmed with the weapons that provided such an advantage to Wilder's men in this defensive position as one of Wilder's men and Wilder's own regiment, the 17th Indiana, whose monument is just a little bit to the north of us, said that during the course of the action here, um, they fired so much that before night, each man had a little pile of empty shells by his position. And he said that at one time in a lull in the fighting, two, pe two men near him compared piles to see which one had done the most shooting. And one of the illustrations of how effective Wilder was as a leader, since this weapon shoots three to four times as fast, what are you likely to have to provide an 18 to 25 year old guy? A lot more ammunition. <laughs> and Wilder had thought about that ahead of time and his men are carrying 200 additional rounds of ammunition in a second nose bag for their animal. And they also have a pack mule train or a pack animal train carrying packing boxes of ammunition right along with them. And Wilder and his men never run out of ammunition in this fight at Vineyard Field. So as the fighting here, just so intense that they've literally got piles of cartridges, how does that then bring us to the end of the day on the 19th? Well, a lot of that has to do with simply the time that it is. It is now into late afternoon and evening, and Wilder's position here backstopping the, uh, the other Union troops in this area, um, and the, um, the Confederates being stopped uh, essentially in the, um, uh, the drainage there and then thrown back allows Federals to stabilize the position along the Lafayette Road, um, and darkness essentially then settles onto the battlefield. There will be one more um, um, Confederate attack um, that um, evening, just as it starts to get dark, a Confederate division under Patrick Claiborne will, um, will attack further north along that line, but it's not really in coordination with, um, with anything. Um, but this fighting here really dies out with the approaching darkness. And uh, the, as Anthony um, uh, indicated, the two lines are in cl close proximity to one another, which prevents the medical aid from reaching so many of the wounded, leaving literally hundreds of wounded soldiers laying on the ground here. Um, some, like Captain Love of the 8th Kansas, will lay here for as much as eight days after the battle before being removed to a field hospital. Now, he's not um, uncared for in that time. Uh, food and water is given him and blankets are provided him. His wound is dressed, but um, before he's removed to a field hospital, it's as much as eight days. Um, in many ways, the most intense fighting at Chickamauga occurs here in the Vineyard Field area, where for about four hours, 16,000 soldiers are engaged, um, and maybe as many as 25% uh, of them become casualties in this fight. Uh, I've been using as my windscreen this fantastic book of battle maps of the Western Theater, um, text by our own Chris White and map by Steve Stanley. Great, great stuff. Um, so, Jim, as we start to get ready for the action on the 20th, I want to back up to something you said where James Longstreet shows up. He's going to play a big role in the action the next day. What's it like to like get off the train, get put in charge of half the army, go? <laughs> well, um, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, back up just a little bit there and, um, uh, and insert something. Um, he gets off of the train and he goes towards the army, but he's got to find it. What's the thing to guide him as to where to go? The, the sound. sound. <laughs> and he's riding to the sound of the guns, except that it's such a large sound, you know, where do you go? Um, and he rides for several hours, darkness settles onto the battlefield. He nearly rode into Union lines, was almost captured. Um, it is not until 11 p.m. that he reaches Braxton Bragg's headquarters and he finds that Braxton Bragg is asleep. Bragg has to be awakened. Um, Bragg and Longstreet have a brief conference and it, it was then, only then, 
that James Longstreet learns that he now commands more than half of the Confederate troops on the battlefield. Got a little inkling of that when he ran into Leonidas Polk um, uh, on his way trying to find Bragg's headquarters, Bragg's headquarters, but he doesn't get that confirmation until he um, awakens Bragg um, that, um, that night. Um, but now he has to make something of this left wing of the Confederate Army of Tennessee that he's been given command of, um, scattered in the, um, in the woods. He doesn't even know many of the troops. Only five of his 17 brigades on the 20th will be ones that he has brought from Virginia. The rest are troops who are parts of Bragg's army or have come from Mississippi or East Tennessee. Longstreet will get a couple of hours of sleep and then in the pre-dawn hours of the 20th will arise and ride out to start trying to make some sense and to get organized for an attack in echelon by division from right to left beginning at day dawn, which is what Bragg told him was going to be the case on September the 20th. I feel like this is where we should insert the dun 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 as we get ready for September 20th. Lots more action to come here at Chickamauga. Stay with us. We've got so much more to explore. I want to thank Jim. I want to thank Anthony. I want to thank Gary behind the camera for his great work today. Thank you for all you do to help us bring these videos to you. And thank you for everything you do to support battlefield preservation.